This video was made possible thanks to the Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation, so check the link in the description for more info. You know, balls can be a bit of a touchy subject. In one hand, no two balls are the same, but in the other hand... Wait, did you say in one hand or on one hand? The saying is on one hand. I'm pretty sure I said on, but we can just do another take if you want. Let's do it again. Okay. There's a handful of balls why all reasons are different. Cut. Did I do? Okay. I'm sorry, doing? I'm dropping the ball on this one. So today I'm joined with Steven Crocker. Steven has a background in directing and producing, lover of extreme sports, also a testicular cancer survivor. So really just an inspirational guy all around. Thank you so much for joining me today, Steven. Thank you for having me here. And uh, you know, if you listen to the podcast that Andrew and I did together, you know that I'm very stupid and he's very smart. So I'm just thankful to be here. Uh, no, I'm just good at pretending, I guess. But I'll leave a link in the description to that podcast so people can check it out. But I remember a couple years ago watching your vlogs when you were going through chemo and kind of documenting that experience. And uh, I know you can't capture everything in a summary, but would you mind kind of going over what you've gone through with that? Yeah, so early 2019, I noticed a uh, lump in my back, which ended up being where cancer had metastasized. Um, before that, I had felt a growing and painful, dull ache in my left testicle. Um, the lump in my back is what finally got me to go to the doctor. Uh, June of 2019, a few days after my 25th birthday, I had my left testicle removed. It was determined that I needed chemotherapy. So after I had my testicle removed, I had um, four rounds of chemotherapy, each were a week long. And then after chemo, the lymph node in my back was still a little bit swollen. So to be safe, I had a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, which they cut me right here down my stomach and then removed my lymph nodes in my uh, retroperitoneum. So luckily I'm almost three years cancer free. Wow, that's insane. So spoiler alert, there's a happy ending there. But yeah, please, please go check out his vlogs on that. So Steven is back with a vengeance to help spread some testicular cancer awareness. Now Steven, I know you're more than familiar with biological aspects of balls, but I thought today I'd show you some cool physics demos involving balls that hopefully we can learn a few things from. Let's do it, I'm excited. Sounds good. All right, Steven, quick history lesson. I'm sure you're familiar with Aristotle a little of course, bit. Of course. Ancient Greek philosopher, fourth century BC, taught Ale Alexander, Alexander the Great. He's actually one of the first iterations of a real scientist, I would say. He even formulated his own theory of how he thought objects moved, his own theory of physics that said that the rate at which an object falls should be proportional to its mass that for two objects of different masses dropped from the same height, the heavier one should hit the ground first. Now people get a little bit testy regarding how widespread this view was, but it was held nonetheless for a few years, give or take about 2000 to be more accurate, until you had folks like Galileo coming around in the 1500s, dropping bombs off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, knowledge bombs. See, Galileo said that Aristotle's physics wasn't worth a velvet painting of a whale and a dolphin getting it on, and that all objects should fall at the same rate. So who is right, Aristotle or Galileo? That's what we're gonna find out today by dropping a bowling ball and a basketball off of this balcony and seeing which one hits the ground first. Now, do you have any predictions before we get started? Being that I have a history of balls with mass, right? I'm gonna say the ball with mass, with the higher mass. So you think the bowling ball is gonna hit the ground first? That's my prediction. Okay, so let's see who's right. So now I'm up here with the bowling ball and the basketball, and we're gonna see which one hits the ground first. Steven's down there with a stopwatch recording. Okay, you ready, Steven? Yep. So this will be on go. Do these look at the same height? Yep. Okay, three, two, one, go. That sounded like one thump. Sorry for the noise, but the drone says that it is at about 15 feet, so we're gonna take that as the height that the balls were dropped from, and we're gonna compare that later. So let's go upstairs and, and talk about what we found. I'm nervous. That looks pretty close to me. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that that is one small step for physics, one giant kick in the balls for Aristotle. <laughs> Well, now that we've concluded that they fall at the same rate, now we can talk about why we were recording the time at all to begin with, because we could kind of eyeball it and see that they were falling and hitting the ground at the same time. Yeah. 
But Galileo showed us that not only do all balls fall at the same rate because this equation here does not depend on mass, but it tells us exactly how it depends on time. And g is just some gravitational constant that tells us how strong the Earth's gravity is. And we know exactly what that is. You probably remember what that is from your intro physics class. 9.7... Uh, yeah, 9.8 meters 9 per second yeah. squared. Exactly. So if we take the time that we measured for how long it took the ball to hit the ground, and we plug that into this equation, then we can predict how tall the platform must have been that we dropped them from. We get around 15 feet, which is almost exactly what the drone told us the height is. One thing I should point out is that all of this kind of assumes that air resistance is negligible. Like I'm sure if we went out there with a feather, we would not get that things fell at the same rate. But if you were to take a feather and a hammer and drop them on the moon where there's no atmosphere, they would hit the ground at the same time. So the time that was measured predicted a height that the balls were dropped from that agreed perfectly with what the drone told us it actually was. It was so close, suspiciously close. Like it kind of makes you wonder if I just chose this setting to get the numbers that I wanted. Well, how about we up the stakes a little bit? Let's take one ball, because that's all I've got. Let's go to Lesnar Bridge and let's drop one off there and try to see how that, the height, you know, we don't know what the height is. Can you come here for a second? Listen, I don't know what the hell your game is here, but how am I supposed to fool everyone if you're suggesting that we just do better experiments? Okay, okay we're gonna go find a higher spot to drop a ball off for science. So since Steven's idea was to do this properly, we're walking over to Lesnar Bridge in Virginia Beach. My mom decided to tag along. Uh, we're gonna go set up the drone. That way we can make sure that when we're dropping the ball, we can see it fall the entire time. And then I'm gonna run up and we're gonna drop the bowling ball into the sand. And I think you guys get the drill by now. We're gonna do this to measure the time it takes to fall, and then we're gonna see if we can predict how tall the bridge is. Okay, we got everything set up. Now I'm gonna go run up to the top of the bridge to drop a bowling ball off. And Steven's gonna stay down here to make sure I don't drop it on somebody. You ready? Three, two, one, go. All right, so we got one second, 63. All right, well, Steven said he forgot to turn the camera on, so. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're gonna go. We both did our recording. I'm out of breath, I just ran back here. Uh, and we're gonna go check our results. So I got 1.63 seconds and Steven got 1.69. To be honest, I thought it would take like more than a second, like closer to two seconds at least, because it's a lot hard, taller. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and take the average of the two times, which is 1.66. And if we plug that time into our formula, so that's 13.5 meters times, I think a meter is roughly 3.27 feet, 44 feet tall. So if we go back to the drone footage, the drone clocked it at just, uh, just above 42 feet. So that was pretty spot on, considering we said it was at the right height from the bottom. So you couldn't really tell perfectly if it was level. I think that's pretty good. That's yeah. Great. 44 feet, 42 feet, that's awesome. To within the uncertainty of, uh, of when the ball actually hit, I think that's pretty good. Yep. Real quick, for those of you who may be hoping that we would have done the two ball dropping, the equation that we're using, the kinematic equation, already assumes mass doesn't matter. So it already assumes they would hit at the same time. So since we got the right answer for the height of the bridge, that also tells us that the balls would have fallen at the same rate assuming air resistance is negligible, which I will always assume it is. Also, any any comments? I only have one ball, so that's all we needed. Yeah, that is also true. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> okay, I think, that, uh, I think that myth is busted that heavier objects fall at a faster rate. What do you say we move on to the next demo? Let's do it. Cool. Now let's shift gears to another thing about balls that everyone finds interesting their storage capacity. I think from a physics standpoint, maybe only you're interested in that. It's actually what got me into physics. Dude, you're freaking nuts. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but I, right now I have two kind of containers. One is sort of spherical with a cork plug and the other is cubic. Pretty different looking containers, but they actually have equal surface area, which means it took the same amount of material to make this container as it did this one. So my question to the folks at home watching is, will they contain the same amount of fluid? 
Now in reality, Amazon makes it kind of difficult to shop for containers based off of their surface area instead of volumes. So this cubic container has about 37 square inches of surface area, whereas the Sphere has about 33 square inches. So this has a little over 10% more surface area, which we will take into account if necessary. But Steven, do you have any predictions of which one will contain more fluid? Will they contain the same amount? What do you think? Well, you know, I'm fondle of balls, so I'm gonna go with the ball-shaped container. You think the ball's gonna hold more fluid than the cube? I think so. It's only one way to find out. Yeah, that looks good. I don't think you could get it any closer. That looks pretty good to me. So as you can kind of see here, or hopefully you can see, the level of the fluid is right below where the cork would be. So this is our little approximation to the sphere being completely filled with fluid. And now, Stephen, what I want you to do is, I guess, put that over the sink, the cubic one, and All just right. start pouring the spherical one in. Let's do it. We'll see if it has 10% more room. I don't know. Looks like it's going over. Uh-oh. <laughs> How about that? So, even though the cube had 10% more surface area, it even had more material than the sphere, it couldn't even contain the same amount of fluid. So what this is telling us is that the sphere has the largest volume for a given surface area out of any other object. Well, really, we've just proven it for the cube, but it works for any other object. Or equivalently, it says that for a given volume, the sphere has the smallest surface area. And I think a good way to illustrate this is just using some Play-Doh. Here we have a nice little pre-roll, little pre-rolled thing of Play-Doh in the shape of a sphere that has some volume. What the volume is doesn't matter. And it has some surface area. And if we smush it, the volume hasn't changed, but the surface area has now increased. And if we smush it more, the more we deform the sphere, the more we are increasing the surface area. But if we run it backwards, the more we're decreasing the surface area, the more it starts to become sphere-like. So that's what happened here, that's what happens in nature, that's why rain droplets are spherical. It all comes back to the fact that, well, nature is lazy. All right, now let's move on to the third and final demo. What do you say? Let's do it. So in the first demo, we showed that objects free fall at a rate that is independent of their mass, neglecting air resistance. Now we're going to show that for rotational motion, things get a little bit more complicated. Translational motion's easy peasy. But here, what we have are three different balls. They all have the exact same mass. The difference is how that mass is distributed. So if you come closer a little bit, we see that the first ball has a bunch of Play-Doh at the center, which is held centered by these toothpicks and there's just this spherical shell around it. The second ball has the same amount of Play-Doh smeared around the inside of that shell, so it's not all at the center. And then the third ball has uh, a little bit less Play-Doh because there's more material, but it's also just smeared around the center. So again, all of the mass is concentrated on the inside of the spherical shell on the inside of the spherical shell. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna see as we roll them down these PVC drainage pipes, we're gonna see which one wins. So the experimental setup for this is actually pretty simple. As I mentioned, we've just got the drainage PVC pipe that's suspended by some twine so that everything is elevated to the same angle, which is about 19 degrees. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna have one ball per ramp or per PVC pipe where we're gonna drop them from the same height and we're gonna see which one hits the ground first. So Steven, do you have any predictions about which one's gonna hit the ground first? Uh, if I had to make a prediction, I would say the one with it smeared on the outside. And my reasoning is because I feel like the weight is dispersed to the outside and that'll cause the edges to roll faster. I don't, gotcha. I'm not a physicist. I don't know. <laughs> That's my uh, dumb logic. By the way, I noticed you've got red balls, not blue balls. Yeah, I didn't want to give the audience blue balls on this one. <laughs> Okay, so the farthest pipe is going to contain the ball with the uh, Play-Doh at the center, and the nearest pipe has the one with the Play-Doh smeared on the shell. So on the count of three, Steven, you ready? Let's do it. Three, two, one, go. Go. <laughs> that wasn't even close. That wasn't even close. That was wrong. <laughs> That's the fun. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, 
by a mile. Now we're gonna do concentrated at the center against the bigger ball that has the Play-Doh smeared on the shell. The small ball is on the farthest side and the big ball is on the nearest side. Three, two, one. <laughs> Again, not even close. Wow. So that was pretty conclusive. I think we saw definitely that the ball with the Play-Doh at the center beats the ball with the mass farther out every single time, even if we made that ball a little bit bigger as my mom's holding over there. Is that surprising to you guys? It surprised me. I'll be interested to see your explanation of it. Yeah? yeah. All right, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Mom, uh, you mind taking a seat for me? Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to hold these tomato cans and I'm going to start spinning you, mm -hmm. okay? And I want you to have your arms out while I'm doing it. Okay, I'm just going to be running around you. Okay. Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. And when I say to, I want you to bring your hands in close to your chest as fast as possible. Okay. When I say to, all right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start spinning. <laughs> all right, hands to the chest. Well, if I bring my legs in. Okay, and you can. Yeah. Really fast, too. I think you saw what happened. <laughs> I think what might make this a little bit more uh, apparent is if we, we go out instead of in. So I'm going to start going really fast with my arms tucked in and hopefully you'll see me slow down by just bringing my arms out abruptly. So let's go ahead and do that. Not really. Not really? That was faster. Now it's good. Yeah. Oh god. For those of you who are a little bit farther along with their physics careers, what I'm getting at is that angular momentum is defined not by just mass times velocity, but by the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. So if the moment of inertia is increasing because the mass is getting farther out, and if angular momentum is to be conserved, then that means that the angular velocity has to decrease as a consequence. So that's why when we're rolling these two different balls where the mass is the same, but the moment of inertia is different, and therefore the angular velocities have to be different as well. To summarize, what I'm saying is that what dictates how fast an object rotates is not its mass necessarily, but its moment of inertia. Mass is much less important. However, in testicular cancer, a mass could be an early sign. So if it's a new development, if you're doing yourself exam monthly and you notice something different, if you notice a change in size, if you notice a little lump, change in shape, that could be an early sign of testicular cancer and it's time to get checked. So that kind of wraps up the demos for today. I hope all of y'all enjoyed it and learned maybe a couple things about testicular cancer. This is gonna be Andrew, Steven, and mom signing off and reminding you to go touch yourself. <laughs>